Hey folks, welcome. Welcome everybody. There we go. Let me start, stop that. Jennifer there on the left, Emily Ferris on the on the right. Emily with a Hey. Is it, is, is it proper British tea, Emily? <laughs> Actually, this is a Rubos tea. I wish it was a proper British tea. <laughs> okay. But I'm trying I'm trying to get caffeine free at the minute. <laughs> oh, that's no fun. <laughs> no. <laughs> Okay, well, at least it's tea, so that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's, that's a good thing, yep. Well, welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I see people uh, coming in here on a Sunday afternoon, so thanks for joining us. Um, just one announcement. Uh, uh, Wednesday night now, uh, Natalie Dupuy will be with us, and uh, she has a session on color for us. So we're going to learn about color on Wednesday at uh, in the Stitch Hour, so join us for that. And uh, also at the top, right up there, right up there, uh, that email or that URL will take you to Emily's Domestica class. And you can sign up for that. That's a new class uh, through the Domestica uh, Learning Channel and uh, uh, Needle Painting with Emily. And we'll talk about that more toward the end. But if you go there and the price is only $20 for the class, that's excellent price. So... Um, you got so we were talking. You got some two thousand people signed up already. So, um, bravo for that. Um, Thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's great. So if you're interested, uh, right up there, that'll take you to it, <clears throat> and you can sign up. Oh, Sharon Bro, Sharon joining us live all the way from Ireland, just north of Emily. Yay. <laughs> north, right? Yep. Sharon. Oh, Sharon's going to keep her language clean today. All right, we can call it. We can label. <laughs> Label it a family show, so that's good. <laughs> we appreciate that, Sharon. <laughs> yep. So um, <clears throat> if, you, if you had a chance to listen to the podcast today, had a great conversation with Emily about how she got started. And, and that's really true. Just uh, in just 2013, and you're already doing this. That's uh, so amazing. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. <laughs> yeah. Just a... Uh, just, uh, what was it a pillowcase? I don't remember now. It's been a while since I recorded. Yeah, yeah. I embroidered the dream catcher on a pillowcase. I think yeah. it was a pillowcase. Also, it was um, like the second one was on a pillowcase. The dream oh. catcher was on some. I don't know how you say it. Ida. Perfect. Ida. 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 Yeah. 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 Which yeah. turned out to not be the best thing for needle painting, but you know, <laughs> no, I was a beginner. No. I didn't know. <laughs> No, that's not a good ground cloth. No, <laughs> that's rather limiting. Yeah, but you learned that right away, so that's probably yeah, 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 yeah. No doubt in your mind there. Stay away from that. Yep, yep, yeah. So I'm sure the pillowcase things went a lot better. Yeah, yeah. Then I learned that was uh, it was a bit thin because <laughs> yeah. it was just an old one. But yeah, it definitely. I found that you could get more detail because obviously there's this more holes in the fabric. I guess. But... <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're not limited to that grid of four. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. The thread count is higher, I think. Yeah, yeah. Did you, when you did the, the for those first ones, were you just holding them in hand? Holding them in hand? Holding, holding the cloth, no hoop or anything? Oh, God, no. I had a hoop. Yeah. Oh, you did? I, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I would have struggled a lot without the hoop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that just, just uh, did you go buy one or hand me down or? It was, I think it was from a local craft shop because I lived in Lincoln at the time and there was a really cute craft shop where you could go and get some of the stuff. So it was just a hoop from there. I think like an LBC hoop. I never know how to say it. LB, LBC, oh, one I of them. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, Jennifer, yeah, Jennifer that, that the L, L, yeah, Elbis or LBs or something. Yeah, I have yeah, yeah. their fanny stand thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got one yeah. of them. Yeah. I've yeah, got like a one that clamps to the table as well. That's quite useful. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. But they're all made in the yeah. UK. I think that's kind of why they're more accessible here. I think. Yeah, they're I like ordered the popular mine. Ones. Yeah, I ordered mine online and it shipped from there. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. I don't know that brand. I like. Okay. Oh, I like because you don't have to. The hoop's not attached. You attach whatever hoop you want with the clamp. So yeah, you don't have I like to that. Buy you don't have to buy the different sizes of hoops that are pre-attached, like mm. with that other brand, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> well, yeah, but that's you know that's good because that's um, because <clears throat> yeah, I have the one that comes on the stick, this one that comes right. on the stick. Yeah. yeah. 
What is that? I, I, I don't remember the names now either. Um, I don't, I can't remember. Whatever. But yeah. yeah so Hard, Hardwick? Hardwick Manor? Hard, Hardwick Manor. Thank you. Hardwick Manor. Yeah. But yeah, mm -hmm. I, I never, I never liked that because you, uh, you're stuck with this. And so, yep. so the ones you guys have, you can just swap the hoops then. Yeah. I find it so much easier. Yeah. Especially yep. because and I got my mom I, one too. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, did you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, mine works, so I'll go with it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I've got a bunch of other hoops, different sizes, and to be able to use the same stand would be a nice thing. Mm. Yeah. Oh well, I'll stick with this. I don't need more hoops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. So that, that so that's pretty good. You learned right away. Uh, Ada cloth is not good for. Uh, Surface embroidery. Well done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's, I feel like I did okay with it, but yeah. Yeah. Well, let's actually, let's look, let's, let's enjoy it. Let's, uh, let's go right to it and enjoy it. Cause we have that shot right here. Oh yeah. Yeah. There we uh, go. So yeah. Not so the then, best. <laughs> Cause when, uh, when you sent all the pictures, I said, I said, I'll bet that's her first one or one of the very yeah. early ones. Yes. Yeah. I think I just drew on it with one of those erasable blue fabric pens um, yeah. and just kind of improvised. I didn't have a pattern or anything. I just drew straight on. And I think, yeah, I had like three, four colors to work with and that was it. Yeah. <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing really, but I really enjoyed it. There was, um, I knew as soon as I started, I, I enjoyed the whole process. Uh, yeah. I. I felt like excited to start the next one, but for the next one, I wanted to think ahead a bit more and plan something uh, that was more like my aesthetic and what I was interested in at the yeah, time. Yeah. Yeah. So, so anyone who wants to start surface embroidery or is starting it, screen grab this shot right here <laughs> and, then, and then you'll, then, then you'll, you'll feel fine about what you're doing. Yeah. Cause then, <laughs> Then you'll know em Emily started here. Everybody has to start somewhere. Yep. <laughs> yeah, you can. Yeah, but, but I, I, actually, I, was, I still have. Oh, uh, yeah, well, okay. I keep it. I keep it. Yeah. But yeah, 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 yeah. You can see the limitations of the ground cloth quite obviously. Yes. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> but I have to say, I thought you did a pretty good job with the feathers, though. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, uh, I think you're being kind, but I, no, 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 they I, look really good. That little red one on the end has that little wispy tail that's sticking out at the angle. It's perfect. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah it does. No, I thought uh, you got, I can't. I, I can't really super remember, but when I did it, I thought you got thanks. those things pretty well for for an mm -hmm. early early try. Yeah, I mean they they, <laughs> they feel like feathers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks. You know, put that in the wind column there, Emily. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. No, I think so. Yeah. So there it is, folks. There's there's your starting point. If you're going to do surface <laughs> embroidery, there's your starting point. And uh, then we go from there. And then this cat now, this is your, so, so you tell the story in the podcast that's out today. Yeah. That you started doing, uh, tell that story again. You were living with your boyfriend and needed to make money. And how'd that start? Oh, <laughs> well, with the, with the little bub who we're looking at now, that was a pet portrait I actually did, um, I think, whilst I was living at my parents. Oh. And it was just it was just purely for fun. I, I think little bub was one of the first Instagram accounts I followed. And it just brought me so much joy just seeing her little face on my feed and she was just such a cute cat um so it was kind of like fan art I guess I just wanted to embroider her basically and I just thought I'd add a little flower crown because I wanted to challenge myself I hadn't embroidered flowers really yet at that point either so I wanted to combine the two and as soon as I posted on Instagram like everyone loved it and everyone was so kind and they were like wow I didn't know you could do that with embroidery floss and they were just all really supportive and I got a lot of people then asking me if I wanted to if I would embroider a pet portrait for them and they would pay me so I was like oh oh okay <laughs> that's awesome Can yeah. Do, yeah that's kind of how that wow. went so that wow so you made the crown up then that the cat wasn't wearing it in the picture no no yeah I just kind of oh improvised wow that's good wow had some fun oh thank you that's awesome. 
Is that all, <laughs> is that all French knots or mostly French knots? Um, there is a lot of French knots, yeah, because I only I only really know like three, four stitches, um, really. <laughs> Um, a French French knots is one of the ones that isn't like a straight stitch, basically. I guess. Yeah, I do enjoy doing the French. I think that was my first time doing French knots. You know, when I think about it, looking back. Ah, oh, <laughs> bless myself. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm always but intrigued. I'm, in I'm always intrigued by the uh, the eyes because you know you you're getting that that uh, glassy look to them. Was that a lot mm. of fiddling to figure that out? Yeah, I felt like at the time, because I wasn't getting paid for it and it wasn't a commission, I was just really enjoying it and having fun and just figuring things out. And I think I learned a lot from doing this portrait. And yeah, with the eyes, I always start my pet portraits by embroidering the eyes first. It's just always the way this, and this was no exception. I still did this with little bub because I feel like, uh, when you're embroidering a portrait, the eyes really are so important, especially yeah. for an animal. If you get it wrong, like it doesn't matter how good you embroider the rest of the fur. If one eye is higher than the other or it's looking kind of cross-eyed, it's just not, unless that's your intention. But mm -hmm. it's, I always knew I wanted to start with the eyes. And yeah. even looking at the picture now, I can see it wasn't, um, there was a lot of stitch direction in the eyes that wasn't right. That I uh, I did it more radial, if that makes sense. So, oh, huh. but rather than going, well, oh uh, yeah, if we can zoom in, yeah. So you've got the black center, mm -hmm. and then I've done all of the green, all kind of pointing towards the center, the stitch direction, yeah. if that makes sense. But I don't do that with my pet portraits mm -hmm. now. What I kind of do is I create like a, I do the stitch stitch direction so it flows with the shape of the eye. I really learned that. So it all kind of goes in this kind of circle until I get to the center, I guess. Oh, all right. well, and I think that creates more realism oh, and okay. movement. Cause I can see, all right. But so I didn't know that at the time. No, that's that's helpful because, so we'll look at that. We have some other pet mm -hmm. portraits to look at. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting, yeah. it's interesting what you say about the eyes because uh, when I first was doing photography and uh, uh, animals and, and people, I mean, people are animals. Um, a, wise mm -hmm. a wise and old veteran said to me, if you're doing any animal, no matter what you what else is going on, get the eyes in focus. Because, yes. Because because yeah. the, the mind will cover will cover you from then on. But if the eyes are out of exactly. focus, exactly. And <laughs> and so you're you got the same thing. Get the eyes right, and the rest of it can really fall apart and it'll still yeah. the mind will still make it work yeah interesting and as, i think as well at the time you can see i think the, the tongue i think the tongue is probably the worst part of little bub bless her but what's really cool <laughs> in the end I think it's little cute. Bub, oh thanks but little bub the owner actually owns this now and he actually brought it off me in the end even though i just did it for fun as like a fan thing so that's quite cool um that's uh -huh. in his house that's okay um, so that's, but, yeah and then so then you also then figuring out i mean the whiskers look pretty automatic but for me the the uh the lighter hairs in the ears you, you were able to get those to um uh, look kind of have a wispy look to them so, yeah yeah they do don't they <laughs> i think um i was just really exper again i really learned a lot from this portrait the whiskers I kind of did my stitches far too long, the straight stitches. It's kind of like a back stitch, split stitch mm, that I did. I do for the whiskers. And I did each stroke far too long. So then there's not as much movement with them. I find the smaller the stitch for it's going to create more curvature. So you can see they look a bit too straight if I was oh. to criticize and critique my own past work. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah okay but this is i mean this is fun because this is now your your first one and then we'll see yeah. here coming up we'll see that you actually got better so mm -hmm. oh thanks <laughs> <laughs> but the first lot. one is still really good though by a whole lot because now oh, here's, thank you because here's lucy look at this thing i mean that's now yeah. now we're getting fur and everything 
and the oh, eyes are perfect. You. Yeah. Oh, look at how much better oh. the eyes are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they look yeah, liquid. Yeah, really. Oh, thank you. A really fun thing right. I started to do as time went on was I really found it brought an extra sense of life to the pet portraits when instead of using white for the reflection of the eyes, to use a shade of blue. And oh. that really added this extra oomph to it because it's like the blue sky being reflected mm -hmm. in the eyes in a way. It wouldn't actually be white, really, unless you were looking in a portrait light. And it was like this stuff I kind of learned as I went along but i always love to add blue to the reflection of the eyes now now here we can see the the thread mm. uh stitches in the eyes are swirling more than radial yeah yeah look at how much more realistic here i'll go back to the cat yeah <laughs> but what, what a huge difference though look at that i mean that's very instructive i was also really afraid of uh color i would say i i usually went for a safer option when I first started, you can see little bub looks almost desaturated because I was quite scared of going for the really bright colors when I was choosing them. Mm -hmm. It was all quite mute, quite muted. But you can see like with Lucy, I was a lot braver and I, I kind of had learned that the more vibrant it actually brought it to life. Um, again, I put the blue reflection on the nose as well. And that, that extra hint of blue on the nose adds more of that life to the portrait. Wow, this yeah. okay. It's because see, it's when you do them side by side. Like if you go with with Bub, <laughs> and and you see the, I mean it, it looks really good when we first looked at it. It looks really good. Yeah. But then then when we go to Lucy, uh, the the, <laughs> cat, the cat really looks quite crude, because you you refine so many things. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, you really refined a lot. I think it's interesting that your stitches in the tongue and the nose go horizontal rather than vertical yes yeah it's all about going with the out like the outline of the nose it's kind of following and flowing with the natural shape and i really like and with the tongue again it's being brave with your colors like when you're looking at it on its own a bright like i don't know how to say it magenta pink you're kind i'm kind of like oh god do i want to use this but it's just being brave and going for the bright colors that because you can see on little bubs, the tongue almost looks gray and not alive. <laughs> right. Um, right. Yeah. I'd love to try and embroider little bub again, you know, and like the exact same portrait and see if how much different it would be. Oh, that, that, would, be be, that would be fun. That comparison. would be fun. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That'd be fun to see. But yeah, I mean, and, and, and I see what you mean about being brave with the colors because throughout all the fur in Lucy, it's, it's so much richer yeah. and you're blending and uh, uh, yeah, there's, there's so much more life to it. I think I had more of a color palette as well. I always find it's really good to have a really good selection of natural colors. And by this time, all of my natural colors, I kind of had all of the numbers memorized. <laughs> <laughs> like I can look at this I know I'm like okay I use 975 there there's 3864 this is DMC by the way it's all I use um I can kind mm -hmm. I kind of it's like second nature to guess what colors I was using I knew exactly when I looked at my reference picture I could look at my floss before I even look at it I know that that was a number I needed for oh. that and I think that really helped my process of choosing colors as well so you can literally, um, literally, you got to the point where you literally could look at the picture and pull floss and know you were going to be right in the ball game before you stitched anything. Yeah, yeah. Like, I could look at it and know. Like, everyone knows 310, though. That's kind of a bit more easier and like, the white. You kind of end up memorizing them, don't you? But, yeah. I don't know, like, any of the greens or blues off by heart, but any natural color shades, because that's what I did with all the pet portraits for, like, five years. Um, I feel, like, very at home and familiar with them and how they work. But yeah. you can, the interesting challenge of the pet portraits, sorry, I'm talking a lot about the pet portraits, but. Well, that's what we're here for, uh, so. so it's, quite, <laughs> it's quite all right. <laughs> okay, cool, cool. Well, uh, one of the greatest challenges of creating realism with embroidery thread is you can't blend the colors like you can with paint. 
um, and this picture was like no exception. It's kind of creating the illusion that the colors are blending. So like if you zoom in on like the right cheek, I guess, of Lucy, or no, I guess, her, yeah, you can see that, that bit's like actually just really yellow when you're looking at it on its own. Mm -hmm. It's not super blending with everything else. You can see how different the colors are. But in my mind, I wish they could blend more, but it's kind of creating that illusion. So when you look far away, it does look quite realistic. When you get up close, it almost becomes this kind of abstractness. That... Yeah. So when you're in, when I'm usually embroidering, when I begin, I'm always like, oh no, this looks, this looks, every portrait about four or five hours in, I'd be like, no, this is it. This, it's not working. I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm like, no, Emily, you say this to yourself every single time, push through, get to the end. And then I'm always, it's like, it's always hard to judge when you've, you've just started such a small area of the embroidery, but it's good to just push through and finish it. And then I'm usually happy at the end. <laughs> now, now when yeah. you when you get done here, we we got a whole bunch of these here. I can move on to the cat, uh, the, the Siamese cat. Oh yeah. When when you get done with a or, or think you're finished with a portrait like this, are there areas where you'll go back and and stitch in a few little uh, strands of of a color to help it blend? Always. More? Always. Okay. Always. Yeah. So I think this particular photo. So if you zoom in, like where the dark gray meets the light gray at the bottom, like a bit lower down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's not the sharpest, but there, this portrait. I took this photo before I had actually added just a few more strands of color to blend oh. that six, four, eight. I think too. That looks like eight, four something to me. But yeah blending them too I, I thought that looked too harsh that blending there so i remember going in with a few more shades but the thing is with the dmc embroidery thread there's not a perfect there's just like not enough colors <laughs> i really it's, wish <laughs> it's interesting it's interesting that you say that with these grays yeah. and whites mm, because natalie, yeah. du natalie dupuy who will be on um sunday and i was really surprised she posted earlier today on instagram she was trying to put together some DMCs in a grayscale, and she said that same thing that there's not yes. enough. There's not enough in there. She couldn't get the gradation she wanted. Yeah, you can't. The six four seven mm -hmm. has this annoying green tinge to it, which doesn't quite work. And then the three seven nine nine, which is the the darkest gray that they have, is just not dark enough. I want another transition between the black and the three seven nine nine. I wish there was a darker shade of gray in between them like if that the more transitions of gradients of colors the more realistic the portrait could be so there is that challenge of trying to blend it but that's why i like it being embroidery i like that challenge of yeah. trying it's, it's all part of the fun <laughs> so and, and jennifer if, I, yeah. if you have questions just cut me off um oh i'm 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 just listening and agreeing and you know i'm like yep yep i don't want to constantly interrupt with my agreeingness okay. so. uh, but... no pl please please interrupt because i'll never shut up otherwise so just 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 interrupt no. <laughs> so so emily this, good you're saying good stuff now that we see this here uh just below the cat's right eye that relatively harsh line from dark to light then you went in yeah. and put more dark into the light or more light into the dark or both it would have been a bit of both to try and transition. So it would have been kind of random strands. So rather than doing like a long and short stitch, I think I remember just adding like a few into the lighter six, four, eight, just adding a few random bits of six, four, six. And um, I think a new, a new shade of gray had come out. DMC had just released a new range of colors. And there was, I can't remember what the gray was now because I haven't used that gray for ages, but that, did help a lot again it was still quite blue which was annoying <laughs> so, yeah. so the the, te um, the technique here is whatever threads bust up that line visually then sorry would you say that again it, i think you so, so broke the, up the, then. the technique is then put in whatever threads break up that light to dark line yes just yeah just visually that bust the... it up here and there okay yeah, that was the goal. Just make it more random as well. So it's not 
kind of really I was really kind of sparsing it out I remember just kind of a bit of a randomness to it so sometimes I think there's um when the portrait's not ridiculously tidy and it's a bit more random I feel like it looks more realistic because in real life like our pets are really messy and not tidy and <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. you know I think that That's adds a bit more sure. of that extra character but I was really proud of I think of the eyes I did for this one because it was say, really fun yeah. getting oh, yeah. to use the blue yeah the eyes are great I love and and there Thank again you. there again we're seeing that not using the what you would you would mentally think the radial stitching would be the way to go but that's not yeah this, this is so much more realistic yeah thank you yeah i was i was very proud the hardest part of pet portraits is blending from where the like uh the eye kind of connects to the nose and getting that radius mm. that can be quite a challenge mm. um now but here we'll, we'll move to that. we'll move to Louis just to keep it moving along here. But I love the so what, what kind of I love the ears. Go what ahead, kind Jennifer. of fabric are you What kind of fabric are you using now? Um, that, now that you're not uh, doing Ada, <laughs> <laughs> I think it was just um, cot or like cotton calico or cotton mu muslin. I think you guys call it. Um, just like a okay. as long for me as long as it was Whoops. kind of medium weight that was. Sorry, what were you going to say? Yeah, it looks like a heavier weight muslin than some of the, the stuff that I have. But the muslin that I use, I use it for backing or maybe you have a thicker weight of muslin or something. Yeah, I think I like it to be thick enough so you can't like see through. And I think it adds more of that expensive uh, quality, I mm. think, to it. It makes it. Because sometimes when the fabric's thin, you know, you're going to spend, well, I was spending like 40 hours on it. And my, like, my cu customers had paid a lot for it. I really wanted them to feel like it had that extra oomph to it, I guess. That it felt like it was yeah. worth the money. It kind of, <laughs> it kind of looks like canvas, like painting yes. canvas. It has that, that yes. weight about it. Yeah, I've. I had to buy, I, I got through so much fabric trying to find the perfect one. And to this day, eight years later, I have still not found my favorite one. So sometimes a lot of people, I get a lot of messages quite often, nearly every day. <laughs> what fabric <laughs> do you use? And I wish I could be like this, this is the one, buy this fabric. Mm -hmm. This is the, this is the, this is the king, the queen of fabrics, but nope, I still haven't found it. So often or not, it's just a chart. It's just an um, experiment and find the one that works for you, I guess. Um, right. Do you, I don't know about you guys. Backing, do you ever use a backing no. fabric? Or Oh, okay, because your well, your fabric's no. thick and heavy enough. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, see, if it's see, really thin, I do double up sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jennifer, see, there's there's a disconnect between uh, Europeans and us when they say muslin, because I'm with you. Yeah. Muslin to me is just this thin, flimsy stuff that you put on the back of something. And right. When, yeah. When Emily says muslin, I'm with you. This is just almost canvas. And it, it, uh -huh. looks, it, yeah. it looks like it's a really nice surface to stitch on and it'll hold up to all those needle pokes. And I'm with, I'm with you, Jennifer. Uh, yeah. Cause it's, it's thick. Cause yeah. the muslin okay. that I practiced on the other day is this really thin muslin that you use for backing. A lot of times um, clothing designers will use it as a mock-up. They'll do their first kind of like a, a mock-up and yeah. make sure it sews together well. And do. Yeah. Yeah. That's what cotton calico is used for, for clothes as well. Like you make your first draft of it because it's like cheap and easy. But mm -hmm. it's interesting you guys say canvas. I think when I have more, my American followers ask me next time, maybe I'll say <laughs> canvas. Yeah, because it, looks, help. it like, looks like a thick yeah. canvas. Looking, yeah. you know, zooming in on your pictures. Mm. Yeah. I but, like uh, it. I yeah. want to I wanna yeah. get my hands Thank on you. some of that. But, but I, think that's, <laughs> I think that's why the question comes up is because you can look at that and know that that is not what we would call muslin. Yeah. No. That's okay. a much better fabric that, that you're using. Yeah. So, ah, there's, yeah, there's, <laughs> I mean, well, there, there's just a disconnect. So, um, I mean, it would yeah. be interesting to know exactly what this brand is. Uh, well, you, whatever you're using now, but, um, uh, so what usually would happen i remember once i ordered from a shop online and it came and it was the 
perf it was perfect the perfect weight like the thread count was really like fine and i never got it again <laughs> oh. i remember that being like the best one um and when i ordered from the shop again i think they'd got a different supplier so it was just one of those things oh. where yeah. i never got that perfect one again so that's why i'm still on the hunt so <laughs> and, yeah, and, and that's the frustration yeah you find what you want yeah. and if you don't buy a mm. small truckload of it uh yeah yeah you know, Six months later, you can't get it again. Yeah, mm -hmm. frustrating. Yep. All right. So now so we're how, moving on, on to or back. How, oh, this is Lucy. Lucy number two. I got Lucy in twice. Yeah. Go ahead, Jennifer. How big are these these hoops? You have them in hoops. I see. How big is that about? Okay. So um, when I first started doing pet portraits, I would only ever do them in five inch hoops because oh, okay. yeah. So they're actually quite small on the small right. side but, but these would still take about 40 hours to complete <laughs> oh yeah but it gives yeah. you an idea too about the fabric because yeah. you know it's like how if you know how big it is overall then you look at the fabric mm. you can kind of get an idea yeah um but i think yeah. cool lucy was embroidered in a six inch hoop because i learned that actually it was better to go bigger with the pet if you're looking for detail especially with the eyes i've learned now i don't think i would do a pet portrait in a five inch hoop again and i would do no smaller than a six inch hoop so but somewhere between six and eight inch even though it's going to take longer you're going to be able to get so much more detail mm -hmm. if i would, yeah i would do that next time the next pet portrait i did fascinating all right okay now so i, I love this this compilation of all the pet portraits you did. <laughs> yeah. On your Instagram, yeah, I, I saw I saw the split screen of Cooper. And oh, at yeah. first I didn't at first I didn't realize what it was. Here, uh, and then I'm like, oh, the other half is embroidery. That's what and then, that's what's up next. <laughs> that's what's up right yeah. now. Yeah. And then little Cooper yeah, yeah, looks yeah. very similar to my Sophie. So you know I'm I'm, I'm poor, partial because my Sophie looks like that. But I this, love this. I love this. This is shot. a dog called. Oh, I, I just love this shot because it shows, it's it's it shows how really effectively how close you are to the real thing. It's really. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, this was a dog called Bear, and it was a real challenge because it was curly. <laughs> the curly hair is really hard, and again, you can see for me there was this yellow kind of darkening around bear's mouth but there again there wasn't the perfect shade of floss for me to capture the right color the yellows were too yellow so i ended up going mm. with i think i mean if i remember this was years ago but looks to me like 3864 that's one of my favorite shades of dmc floss for portraits um yeah I was I was really proud of myself when I'd finished that one being being curly. And I really remember thinking the pink around the eye was really satisfying to do. And you can again you can see I've I've used the blue reflection in the eyes again there. Yep. To create more of that sky reflection. Which makes I think that makes the portrait look happier, like when you're thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Being reflected from the sky. And it helps but the I eyes look more liquid. Yeah, I like that word. I haven't, I haven't heard that before. I like it being called liquid. That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it does, yeah. They're liquid, dewy eyes of the dog looking at you with love. It's, it's, <laughs> it's interesting to hear you discuss this, though, because you hear from designers all the time, you know, I can't find the right this color or that color. And my reaction yeah. is there's hundreds and hundreds of DMC colors. Don't tell me you can't find the right color until you look at something like this and you realize that if the right color existed, it, it would, you know, how it would fit in. Yeah. It is, it is mad. Like I think there's like, it seems that like there's 40, 50 shades of green for DMC, but like for gray, you've got like eight, 10 <laughs> and that's <laughs> kind of it. And it does those kind of things. Um, it makes you, sh makes you realize the natural color palette for DMC is actually a little limited compared to their brighter, more obvious colors. I think maybe it's the dyeing process is more complicated for creating the natural yeah. shades. Um, but yeah, I think I've, I've heard people have 
who also do realistic portraits, they dye floss themselves to try and get the perfect colour. So they just buy like a, a, a skein of white and then they dye that them at home. Mm -hmm. I haven't tried it myself, but it's definitely a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> now, now talk to me about the mental process when you look at a dog that is literally fuzzy <laughs> and, and and what you have to do we, we we need to keep moving along here I'm, i got too many questions about these but they're fun to look at but the <laughs> mental the mental process of saying all right i've got a fuzzy dog i really can't create fuzz with thread so mm. it, it a challenge i would think to make it look fuzzy without taking a comb and just destroying the fibers <laughs> it is it is really hard and the first thing I do whenever I get a pet portrait is to I Photoshop it. So the photo, it, it helps me get to know I, I'm quite good in Photoshop. I think I've been doing that since I was about 10. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'll edit the photo, get the lighting right, because sometimes photos can be a bit over um, overexposed. The photos can be. And so it's all about darkening the shadows and make I. I look at it in black and white. I'm really analyzing the lights and the darks and how it all works. And that helps me figure it out when I, then I finally trace the outline of the pet when I'm happy with it and how it's worked. Um, but then with the curls, what I usually would, I, what I remember doing, cause it's been actually, I think years since I've actually embroidered a pet portrait now. But say on the ear, there's a big obvious curl. Um, you can kind of see there's like a big kind of white one like yeah um, and what i would always do is i would do the big curls first that's always how i would again eyes and eyes nose and mouth first always every single pet portrait but when again tempting the fur i'd usually always fill out those curls okay. the big obvious ones and then it's kind of so the portrait i remember it looking just like all of these random curls were filled in and then it's all about filling in the space in between. So you can see my my stitches are a bit straighter. It's not like all uh, curly. So it's kind of hard. I feel like I need to do a course on this. <laughs> well, I, I, think and, um... it, I think it would be fun. But so then then the, the bigger features, the curls, the, the big dominating features of the ear. Yeah. Then give you, you put those in that gives you your infrastructure and then you fill in around. Yes. That. Okay. Yeah. yeah and then again it's, it's about like with the eyes once you've got those big ones what you kind of fill in in between the hu the human the human brain fills in for you so as long as you're filling that up and creating the shadows um that's what usually works so, so for me it was so important to get the eye right for this like i feel like it really made the portrait yeah to capture the emotion mm -hmm. of there no, I, this is really instructive. So many people want uh, stitched portraits of their uh, favorite pets, uh, and so yeah. th you know these these kinds of things I think are really helpful to people. Um, this is the first time I've ever talked about my pet portrait process in eight years to anybody. <laughs> oh, wow! <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's fun. It's fun to talk about it, and yeah, I do really want. I, I again, it's a question I get nearly every day. Emily, are you going to release a? pet portrait tutorial and I'd I would really love to teach people how to embroider their own pets especially when they've passed away and I think there's something really nice about embroidering your pet like all of the hours that go into it and the love and the time I think it's a nice way to honor someone who is such a big part of your life and right. I'd love to teach people how to do it well there's your next domestica mm -hmm. class right there exactly <laughs> I was just thinking that same thing <laughs> tell, tell them you need to fly to Spain again we got to do another <laughs> Yep. Uh, gee shucks <laughs> <laughs> yeah got it. okay now i think this... i'd love to do yeah oh sorry oh, go ahead. I'll no, go you ahead. Go. you'd I'll love to go. do what go ahead i was gonna say i'd love to do the pet portrait tutorial myself though i think it's something i would like to do off my own back on my website and um mm. but because i can do video and film and stuff so i'd like to try and the challenge of creating my own online e-course i think that's my ultimate goal yeah. But I'm quite slow at finally getting to stuff. It's, I should have made it years ago, and I still haven't yet. But <laughs> one day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, so what, what's Cindy saying here? Where? Oh. Oh, we got to know then, Cindy. Al, of course, of course, Alice hmm. and Cole would know. 
Okay, but see, that's mm-hmm. that's getting out. Of, you know, there it is again, getting outside of the U.S. to get that muslin. There's a de- difference in definition. I'm convinced of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, we got to explore that more. We'll be in touch, Cindy. Thank you. Okay, now <laughs> now we go to this one. I love these comparison shots. I put all of them together so we could talk about them. Now this is this oh, shows the, pro- the progression of your stitching. How much more? How much finer you've gotten? How much more detailed? Um, yeah. Just, yeah. So that butterfly was the second ever hoop I did after the dream catcher. That's when I, I planned this one out a bit more. I kind of really wanted it to be the painted lady because it was one of my favorite butterflies at the time. It still is really. Um, and I think this floss was just, oh God, I, it kills me to think I did this now. But you know, I was only 19. <laughs> you know, you know those terrible multicolor packs of thread you can get from Amazon. I think I had oh. brought one of them. <laughs> and <laughs> that's what I used to make the butterfly. And it was this bad quality embroidery. But unknowingly, this was when I didn't know it, but I was kind, I, this is my first bit. My first embroidery wear, I'd started to use long and short stitch. And the butterfly was a really good way to learn stitch direction as well. Because oh, yeah. obviously you're yeah. going out with the wings. But with the, it's, it's fun to, cr- to critique and compare, actually. Like, Emily, you did this wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but um, well, when, when most you... of all, I, I, yeah. Go ahead. No, oh, go ahead. Sorry, go on. I was going to say, most of all, um, I'm really happy with the colors I still chose. And I think that I would say to my past self, well done on still getting the colors, okay? But the actual, I remember using, I think two, three strands of floss at a time. And now pretty much I will always only use one, like nearly everything, I only ever use one strand of floss. That's gonna really help you capture more detail. That was a huge difference, I think, between the two. And and your statements about getting uh, bolder with colors or more courageous with color co- courageous with colors really shows yeah. up in this one. Oh yeah yeah it does doesn't it you can yeah. see again I was still quite cow a little bit on the and again I think my taste changes I think at the time I was a bit it was just my aesthetic at the time I didn't like color as much as then I think too so I knew I was going to hang it on my wall I didn't actually want a really bright vibrant butterfly on my wall I kind of wanted it to look aged and a bit rustic whilst now I think my style has changed and now I, I'm not afraid to have a bit of color on my wall and make it more vibrant and like life I guess um not so aged it's it, inter- I, yeah it's interesting to me that you went with a uh your ground cloth is not white in the second one mm that was something that I started to change over the years because when you're in, embro- it's always good as a beginner to embroider on a white background. One, you're going to be able to trace the outline so much easier. Um, and two, you're going to be able to choose and see colors. The brain kind of plays tricks on you. When you have a different color background, it's a lot more difficult to choose your colors and mm. embroider as a beginner because it's just the way color works when you have two different colors next to each other. Um, but I found that it added that little extra oomph to it, having a different colored background. And it's something I really like to try and do now. Now I feel more confident in choosing my colors over the years. I think I'll always, I'm always going to start preferring to embroider on a non-white background, mm-hmm. I guess. But I, I never really liked white backgrounds that much. That was one of the things that really draw me, drew me to cotton calico um was the fact it was natural and it still had all of the seeds in it like mm-hmm. from the, the cotton seeds i like the rusticness i don't like it being so um the fabric being all perfect and clean and white and really processed i like it kind of again it's that timelessness of being able to embroider on whatever fabric you have available to you and yeah. it doesn't have to be the most expensive thing i like it feeling a bit like you don't need expensive materials to make it Mm-hmm. part of it now in in the instance here on the right your, your most your 2018 uh version uh in that instance would you select the colors the threads and place them on a white background or do you place them on the background in which you're going to stitch them i think for this i just went full on in i don't even think i had any plan 
I think I just I just started going in um there'll be like a time so usually I'll plan like a little area so if I look say I'm gonna look at the orange shades I'll just choose a free five orange shades out of my favorites and start doing that and then again same if I start choosing browns I'll look at the browns and but it's kind of as I go which is quite fun um I enjoy doing it as I go really and just choosing my favorite colors too like what I like um like so you'll notice in a lot of my embroideries if I embroider with green I definitely have a tendency to I I like warmer shades of green I don't really embroider with the greener shades of a DMC Mm -hmm. green I kind of like it to be a bit of a warmer but that's just my taste you know I'm adding in my that's why I always try this is actually a tutorial that's available like I show people how to embroider the painted lady on the right um but because I made this for a tutorial I actually didn't use as many colors as I would if I was doing it without so this was actually me trying to limit the amount of colors I was using here because I didn't want a beginner to have to go out and buy 40 you know skeins of floss and they might not even enjoy I'm sure they would enjoy the embroidery but I wouldn't want to make them have to buy uh, so much so I try and limit my patterns to like 17 colors or less usually it's it's interesting that you bring that up because I've had that Mm. same discussion in the past month twice with designers oh wow (laughs) no no, it's exactly that same statement that what i put what i put out for a kit is not what i would do if i were doing it for me because i have to limit the colors and i don't want people to have to buy a skein that they might use all six inches of it and yes uh, exactly and so it's it's i mean it's interesting there because that tells me then that there's another level to this if you don't care how many skeins of, of thread you buy. There's, yeah. there's there's another level to the gradation of color and the look that we're not getting here. Is that, can I say that? Yes, yes, definitely. Like, like it's exactly like you say, like if I was embroidering just for fun, I would choose the tiniest, use the tiniest bit of one other color like you say it would be one snip and that would be it and then i feel like there's no point putting that in the past and having to make someone go and buy that one color and it's kind of fun like trying to challenge yourself to limit the color palette like how realistic can i make this look without having to have all of the colors in the world and i think that that works as well yeah well i think it's an inter- it's an interesting discussion um mm. in terms of of what is a practical design that you can sell versus what would you stitch with without any limitations and then flip that over to the other side as the person who buys the pattern if if you want to experiment put in some other colors and see what you can yes. do with it um, yes exactly i'd i'd love that if people I've, I've seen people do their own color palette for my patterns which is always really nice to see people experimenting and being creative and trusting their own creative vision as well. That's yeah. always nice to see. Okay, see, that's interesting. Okay, now we're gonna, oh, this uh, this is the, the original in its hoop here. Yes, yeah. Okay, now the B, the B is another example, uh, three years difference in your stitching. Yeah, so that was the first B I ever did. And that that gained me a lot of following on Instagram as well, that really, like propelled I guess my career I got a lot of attention for the bee I think it's because I made it this eyes look cute I don't know but I look at it and I cringe so much now like it's it's done so bad <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah you can see the difference with the bee on the right um, <laughs> I, I, it's, I think the bee on the right looks a lot more my my goal was to make it look as fluffy as possible because bees <laughs> are just really fluffy and fuzzy. And I had more reference pictures. I had a better, that really made a difference. Like having a higher quality, the highest quality reference picture you can get, that's always gonna help you make it more realistic. Realism is what you're after. Yeah. Um, well, the same could be just or, two yeah. different species of bees. You know, I think it's very cute. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> I, I like them both. They're they're like two different species of bees. 
Yeah. One on the left I made up. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, you know, that's fine. <laughs> But, yeah. but it is it is interesting because if, if I think you, again, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Oh no, you broke up. Please, please go oh, on, go on. Oh, nuts! I hate when that happens. <laughs> if if you if you say this is the same species of bee, though, the one on the left looks more like a spider. Um, yeah. <laughs> with, with defined <laughs> head, thor thorax, and abdomen. Where the mm -hmm. the one on the right looks more like the bee because you filled in the body and made it fluffy, so it. Uh, um, mm -hmm. And then the the whiter wings. Yeah. Make such a big difference. I think with the one on the left. Oh. Yeah, the one on the left was again. I was using. I was applying my own aesthetic at the time as well. Like my goal wasn't to make it really realistic. It was to hang on my wall and look good. There was no intention to sell or to show how realistic I could do it. It was all about making pretty art for my room at this point. And I didn't like deep blacks. I, I just like dark browns. And I think that's why it's mostly brown on the left. And I used cream for the wings instead of white. Um, this is all on purpose because that's the look I was going for. But you can see with the one on the right, I was going for more realism. Like bees are actually quite black. We're not, when you look at all of the pictures of them, like, you know, the really cool macro shots that you see of insects and the wings, again, I mean, they're more sheer. I did the best I could with right. what you can do, but and, yeah, and making it more white. Yeah. And the ground cloth color changes again. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is lit. This is my first time embroidering on linen, I remember, with this bee. Uh. Yeah. It was a bit of a challenge because there's more, more uh, not as much of a thread count. It was yeah. a bit harder, I found. Now and then now here's your your bumblebee kit, and yes. uh, and that even takes on a different look. <laughs> that so this bumblebee right here is based off that 2017 embroidery of a bumblebee there. Right. That's what the kit is based on, but I simplified it again so there's not as many colors. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it'd be easier as a pr rather than having to fill out the wings, which adds on like another four to six hours to the entire process for this the wings are just filled out with split stitch just the outline not actually the wings oh. filled in and i think yeah and i think you still get a really similar effect um, right but see there's that discussion again that there's there's, a, there's <laughs> you know there's the other level to this b with the wings filled in and yeah here, here in the kit is the outline of the veins and let the yeah. ground cloth do the job yeah and i think it's just a less floss for them to have to purchase because this was originally a downloadable pattern for years before i turned it into a kit um but it was just i just didn't want to make people buy too much and yeah. i didn't want people to worry it's so much easier to instruct someone on how to embroider neatly than like how to tell someone how to embroider a bit mess a bit messily i guess <laughs> like you can see mm -hmm. I, I don't know why but it is harder to write the instructions like hey just go with the flow i think people would be like no tell me tell me what to do yeah. <laughs> i don't want to just and i think so on the the first the 2017b when you look at the yellow bands and the you can see i'm a lot more it's not so regiment yes you can see the the, the 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 long and short stitch is kind of really more experimental, really like looking a bit messier and going out. It's not so neat because that wasn't the goal. wasn't to make it look neat. Again, nature does, isn't actually perfectly neat. <laughs> it's you always want to make it look a bit messy if you really want it to look uh, realistic. Yeah. Oh, that's well, so that's what I've learned anyway. So you see, you can see here the bands on the um, the bottom bit is kind of a lot more neat. Compared on the, to on the kit, yeah, the, there's, there's better yeah. defined stripes, and then that that yeah. kind of rounded square on the um, uh, thorax on between yes. the wings is more defined. You went with a much subtler color in the 2017 one. Yeah, that that is actually because that gray that I'm using on the 2017 one is by a brand called Venus. And I think it's a color called 2978, <laughs> if I remember the color right, and it's actually um, a dark shade of gray that you can kind of use in between the DMC 310 and the DMC 3799. And um, 
but it's just not as high uh, of, a, of a sheen. It's kind of mm. like a fluffy thread. But I didn't want to in the kits. I didn't want to have to like. I mean, the, the downloadable patterns. I thought it's good. if I say to them, right, you need to get ten skeins of DMC, then there's one random skein of <laughs> Venus that they might not be able to find in their country, or or it might not have been accessible to them. So I really right. wanted to just make sure it was all to the same brand. So which is why you can see the color stand out more, I guess, more yeah. popping. Yeah, yeah, and that's just a pure economic issue that you just have to deal with. Yeah, now. yeah. Um, Mel, Mel, we have a mushroom kit coming up. Just <laughs> hang on. <laughs> okay, now this this is uh, the uh, olive green bee. <clears throat> oh yeah, this is the same. This is the bee for the uh, the kit, but just on a green fabric instead. Yeah. Just to show, I wanted to show what it looked like if you didn't use 3799 and you used 3371 in replacement for the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So that in my digital tutorial, like I, t I tell, uh, I say it in a digital tutorial, like you can use 3371 or 3799, whatever choice you want, whatever effect you want to go for. Um, but with the kits, it all comes with 3799. Yeah. Okay. I hope that makes sense. Yep, it did. And then now we have the bee, <laughs> the bee on the the cosmic one. You've oh, worked, yeah. You've really this... worked this bee. This is great. You've gotten maximum use out of this bee. <laughs> I just really, I think it was just not, it's just my favorite thing to embroider. I think I still, I, I'm going to embroider more bees forever. It's my favorite thing. <laughs> I love the colors. <laughs> but yeah, this was a really fun personal project. There was no intention behind this i just really wanted to do a an embroidery with the background filled in which i hadn't got to do before and mm -hmm. try and let my i was trying to let myself go with bright colors <laughs> with using the yeah. pink at the front try trying and kind of successful or did you feel like yeah was... yeah i still feel like when i look at it, i'm like oh maybe it was too bright <laughs> uh -huh. but i was trying to have fun with it and let myself go i guess well it, but that's but that i think is important to just uh, stretch things a little bit yeah and, get out of my comfort zone yeah all right now we have the um uh, the moth yeah this is another digital tutorial you can simplify it and moth, which i just think is beautiful i just thought, I, I looked at it and i thought i need to embroider these colors Again, I'm not very drawn to natural uh, kind of warm autumnal shades quite often. Um, yeah, I enjoyed that a lot. Yeah. Well, for, for me, you know, I don't Another think dimension. If you wanted to create, I think it'd be really good to use a turkey stitch for the body just to make it really fluffy and fun. Yeah. Oh, that would have been good. <laughs> now, that's interesting. Critique, critiquing it now. Yeah, because moths tend to be quite fuzzy. Mm hmm. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. Now, here's the same. This is the same moth. Yeah. Same moth on uh, at night. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, you can see I did the turkey. I did the turkey stitch here for the body on this one. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I was just experimenting. I'd never used a turkey stitch before, but it was fun to just have a little mess around and try and get the effect. But you can see the on the moth before, it's a lot neater because that was the second time I embroidered the moth. So I took what I had learned from embroidering it on the dark fabric and I applied that to this one, but made it more refined and better for someone to follow it as instructions. Because this was just me experimenting here on the blue one. The turkey stitch works, doesn't it, Jennifer? Oh, yeah, definitely. I like that oh, fuzzy same. body. But the other one looks nice and fuzzy, too, though. The The way those browns blend yeah. together on the back of the body and stuff gives it a fuzzy look. Thank you. I'm glad it does. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, well, well, we'll get to, uh, the, yeah, yeah. To me, you've captured in both of these the texture that we see in moths, which is different from butterflies. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. And they're, it's they're, softer and, and dustier. Yeah. And... yeah. There. Thank you. Yes. 
dustier. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Well, they actually do leave dust because yeah. we have a lot of moths <laughs> in Colorado, and and there would be the oh, moth okay. dust on the walls. So, so, but but you've you've changed you've changed the overall texture and, and captured what a moth is, which, yeah. Mm. Interesting. Okay, we got to keep moving. Thanks. <laughs> Unfortunately. Oh no! Did I talk too much? Yeah. No, no, no. Ah! no, no. It's my it's my job. It's my job to keep moving, and I have oh, too, okay, ma good. too many questions. Now here's here's the project on uh, in inspirations. Um, yes. And I think I commented in the uh, podcast we did. I, I just love what you did with the leaf outlines all around it. You gave it in. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Again, yeah, I, I, I kind of. I use this as a another way for me to experiment and get out of my comfort zone a little bit. And I was trying to, Emily, everything you do doesn't have to be completely realistic, 100%. You can create the illusion of it. And it was just fun to experiment and just do something with just it being the outline, but then the realistic moth in the middle. And I, I really like the, the final end result. Oh, yeah. Now, it's interesting. And then you... Oh, go ahead, Jennifer. That's fine. Oh, mm -hmm. you had talked about doing it all in white work, doing it all yes. white. And I know you said for for the magazine it wouldn't show up maybe good, but the white work would be yeah. gorgeous. And yeah, that would be I'd love really to see pretty. someone do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I think it would be cool if you use like a tech, not DMC floss as well. Like if you were to use like wool, I think that yeah, would be really cool. Something a little Fluffy, thicker, white on white. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to see someone experiment and do that be, be nice to see i think it's interesting that if we go back to the uh moth at night that the the four wings you kept pretty much a straight line across the uh front edge yeah and then when you went to the inspirations design then you made more of a v-shape oh yeah yeah i think i again i'd learn stuff from them every every single embroidery I do I feel like I'm always learning and again it's trying to not make stuff too straight trying to create movement at all times I think it makes it more I don't know well, and adds, it adds more life mobs have yeah and different moths yeah. have different body shapes some of them are more straight like that yes. and some of them do look yeah. more butterfly like yeah exactly but it does put a, an extra element of life in it on the inspirations one yeah as well, I think, um, so this moth was kind of based more, the emperor moth was based more on like, um, I wanted it to look more like how they actually do when they're sitting and resting. Whilst with the Helena gum moth one, I kind of had done it more inspired from taxidermy. So when, when moths mm. and butterflies are, pin are pinned, their wings are more pinned up in an unnatural kind of shape, but it displays their wings better when they're pinned so this was based more of like a taxi dime taxidermy style rather than a head and a gum moth what it would actually look like resting oh, okay. i guess yeah if that's nice. if that's what i mean yeah thanks nice. <laughs> yeah. yeah all right moving along here now here's the mushroom who was that mel here's here's a mushroom for you <laughs> And, and I, I oh, love dear. the way you're putting uh, all around your main subject, you're putting environment. It's uh, It really adds a nice flavor to it. Thank you. Yeah, it's something I've really started to enjoy doing. You know, when I first started, it was just the object in the middle. But I've really enjoyed adding that extra element of, like, you know, this one, like, dancing ferns all around. I think it adds more to the atmosphere of the, the look. And the contrast of colors is always nice to look at to the eye, I think. Now this is this is your first non-animal, non-insect piece that we've seen. Is this is this yeah. a, is this a progression, or did you just say left turn here? I'm going to try something else. <laughs> I had done mushrooms before as well. That first year when I'd done like a bee and a butterfly, mushrooms was also something I had embroidered before. Um, so it wasn't the first time I'd embroidered a mushroom, but I'd always wanted to do the fly garrick. So I just think they're gorgeous. And they just remind me of like fairy tales and it's like folklore. <laughs> and I had to do it. It's just iconic if it was going to be my first one. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see it works. Yeah. Fun. Thank you. Yep. Let's see. What do we got? Oh, and here's the kit. Now, it, 
Now, it, again, see changing the background color in the kit mm. adds, you know, I really, I really wanted to show, I usually embroider the pattern twice because I really want my tutorials to be really followable and not confusing at all. And I like to learn what I did the first time. So with the black mushroom, that was the first one I embroidered. Um, and you can see it's probably the reflections kind of different. The colors are a bit different. It's a bit more, not as neat and refined. I've also added some actual reindeer moss at the bottom of this fly agaric. I like embroidered it in <laughs> yeah. um, like real moss. Um, <laughs> but this one is the second time I embroidered it. So it's a lot neater and a lot more refined. And I think it just helps uh, do the step-by-step -step photos as well for the people that buy the patterns or my kits. Um, it's usually how my process goes anyway. And I like to show people what it looks like on different colored backgrounds. It's like, it's like, I like to show people like, oh, look, if you do it on this background, this is the, this is the effect, or you can do it on this one or whatever your favorite color is. And yeah. Yeah. Maybe I just overthink too much, but <laughs> no, no. we got to try things. we got to try things here. Yeah. What, uh, what do we have? A... Questions here. Hang on. Just where do you get the kits? Oh, well, here. Yeah. Uh, at Emily's Emily's site is where you can get the kits. Yeah. I have an Etsy shop where I sell them, but they're not currently available because I, it's only me packing all of the kits and um, I'm working on some other projects at the minute and my supplier doesn't have enough supplies. <laughs> the odds are not in my favor, but um, I always announce on my Instagram when I'm going to release more. And I always, I have a newsletter as well, which you can sign up to if you, so you don't miss out. But I do have digi digital tutorials for all of the patterns. I know it's not quite the same as the kit when you want to have it all delivered and it's all there and ready to go. But yeah, you can get a digital tutorial as well and download it. And it's, it's all the same stuff that you get in a booklet in the kit. You just need to source the materials from some online shop that you like to go to, I guess, or craft yeah. shop. Right. The, uh, the, best, the <laughs> best way to keep up with Emily is through her Instagram account. She's most yeah. active there. And that's where you'll yeah. find out um, about the, uh, the upcoming kits. And like the bee, mm. she's had a hard time keeping that in stock. And uh, she, she'll have a, she makes up her kits on the bed and she'll have a bed, a bed, <laughs> bed full of them and then they're gone. So uh, follow her on Instagram and then you'll know when they're coming up because they are going fast. And of course, as, as with everyone else, getting uh, threads and ground cloth is just a pain in the butt these days. So, mm. um, yeah. Yeah. So whenever you stitch it, is the hoop that you're stitching, is that the final hoop or do you switch out to a different hoop for the final finishing? I do, do you wash? usually switch out. Oh, I never okay. wash my embroideries. No, no? because okay. I am so, maybe I'm a little bit OCD whilst I'm embroidering, but I'm so definitely afraid of getting dirt on them <laughs> whilst I'm embroidering. Cause you know, you mm -hmm. spend hours doing it, don't you? Um, so usually when I'm embroidering, as soon as I start to feel my hands get clammy or sweaty, I mm -hmm. go and wash my hands. And I don't let, like, if I'm not embroidering, I, I put it away. I don't let dust collect on it or anything like that. So that right. often for me, I don't need to wash it, you know, because I just keep it so clean whilst I'm embroidering. I don't need to, I guess. Yeah. All right. And then the hoop, the hoop is an LBC hoop. I usually embroider in because it's got a tighter grip on the fabric. But I like the look of the siesta hoop, which you can see, I think, in the mushroom kit here. I've got a siesta hoop that the mushroom's in. And I just like the the brass screw. I just think it's more aesthetically oh, okay. pleasing, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Now this <laughs> this butterfly here with all the flowers. Oh yeah. That's one of my favorites at the minute. <laughs> <laughs> It is really mm. bright. It's beautiful. Yeah, I never challenge. I want to challenge myself to. I don't embroider flowers very much. Um, so again, I really wanted to push myself to be more colorful and embrace it. And I really wanted to see if I could create the illusion of iridescence or like the holographic kind of look of a blue morpho butterflies. They're kind of like quite reflective. Mm -hmm. 
and I wanted to challenge myself and think oh can I show that with embroidery floss and I feel like I did I think it looks kind of reflective and I was really yeah happy definitely with that. thank you yep yeah there's an electric there's an electric to it yes yeah. mm -hmm. and I think for the first time I used beads and bullion knots which I'd never done before I wanted to try a different texture for the body so the body's actually loads of little bullion knots and then two little beads for the eyes and that was fun just having a t that was my oh, tiny yeah. mini experiment here. here let me oh yeah <laughs> i'll zoom right in on the body oh yeah look at that. <laughs> you know that looks good. Baby, i like it really... oh thank you well your, your your stitching holds up really well zoomed in look at how nice that is. oh yeah <laughs> Thank you. This was fun because I just did this one for myself so I could use as many colors as I wanted and just really go for it. I think I just embroidered this outside in the park whilst it was really a really sunny summer. Um, that was really nice. Nice. Ah, beautiful. <laughs> and, then Thank I love you. The, and, the, and then the pansies. I just love the pansies. That's oh, I know. <laughs> Thank you. I feel like, again, that was, I wanted to do flowers and I love pansies. I just think they're gorgeous. And you, and I thought this would be a fun uh, tutorial for people to do because like you could finish one pansy at a time and have that sense of achievement rather than waiting 40 hours later and then it's done. You kind of can finish one yeah. at a time and feel more proud of yourself. And I think that gives you more oomph to do the next one, I guess as well. And you can choose whatever mm -hmm. colors you want. You didn't have to choose the same colors that I did. But that was yeah, because pansies are so colorful and they change yeah. colors within the flowers so drastically. It's it's a fun mm -hmm. way to play with your needle painting and to, yes. to experiment and get the hang of it without having to feel like like it has to be perfect because the pansies exactly. just do their thing. Yeah. It's very good for beginners, like the stitch direction, it all kind of makes sense. You're just angling all the stitches towards the center. And it's just mm -hmm. a really good way to learn and have fun with colors and blending at the same time. Because, yeah, I enjoyed making it anyway. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's really instructive. The, the, um, like, I'll, I'll move the cursor around this big one here. Uh, how yeah. you, you break up the lines with the darker colors by having, sometimes having them way, reach way out into the next color. Yes. Oh, you're noticing it. You're noticing the details. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, <laughs> that was the intention with that. Yeah. It kind of adds a bit more of that blending. Right. Um, breaks it up so it's not so, it wasn't such a harsh dark against the yellow. That little tiny mm -hmm. bit of a darker purple added a bit more of that soft softening to the pansy. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's instructive. Yeah. Well, we got questions over here again. Um would you ever try embroidering a carp or fish as the scales and colors are very diverse? Oh, yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. That'd okay. be fun. There's yeah, yeah. There's, there's carp, some, that would be really time. pretty. Yeah, I'd like something. to do a frog as well, but that's a bit different. <laughs> oh, that would be an interesting this is a, challenge, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. just to challenge myself. I'd like to do a person. I think that would be really fun. But. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, how do you stitch and chart at the same time? Stitch and chart. What do you mean? What do you reckon uh, stitch and chart means? I, do you I, mean like write the instructions at the same time? Probably. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's not really any charting here. It's just long and short. Yeah. Stitch, well, like the, so. the instruction writing, I guess. Yeah, it is quite hard. That's usually why I have to embroider the embroidery twice. But yeah, it's just a case of as I'm embroidering, I, I don't. I can't relax like I usually do when I'm doing it for fun. It's more I have a piece of paper or my computer and I write down, I use this color, I, I, I use this many strands, and it's just a tiny note to myself. And then when I finish the embroidery at the end, I write the instructions up using all of my little notes um, I made. And as well, when I'm just looking at all the step-by-step -step photos, I can see myself when I'm looking at my step-by-step -step pictures, what I did. So it's quite easy to just write up from my pictures. I'm quite a visual person more than I'm a writing person. So 
that's why I have so many step-by-step -step photos in my tutorials because I, I think everyone secretly it's always better when you have loads of photos to follow rather than just loads of writing um yeah this is this is so much easier when you have pictures <laughs> yeah yeah uh let's see do you sit at a table with one strand colors around you and how many needles threaded I only use one needle at a time I find it so much easier personally i have seen other people have like 20 at a time which just blows my mind but i find <laughs> it easier to just work uh, one at a time and i used for years i used to just sit on the sofa and hold my embroidery hoop in my hand and i just had some halogen uh led light bulb that was like a tenor from argos i don't know any american followers probably won't know what argos is but it's just some local shop <laughs> um in the uk I, it was all quite cheap, but now I have a bit. I have a better magnifying lamp from the um, Daylight Company, so I can see better. I sit at a I sit at a table with a chair because it's better for my back and just my posture. And then I have a, a clamp, so I don't have to hold the hoop with my left hand because you can get repetitive strain injury after a while. But I mean, if you're a complete beginner and you're only doing it like a couple of hours a week. You don't have to have the intense setup that I have. It's only because I am doing it every day. I thought, hmm, maybe I should start looking after myself. I'm not going to be young forever. <laughs> yeah, a yep. Of, a lot of truth there. A lot of truth. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> start early to take care of that back because after a while. Yeah. yeah. Make sure you make sure you go and get massages regularly. That will oh, help a okay. lot. Oh, okay. I'll take that tip. I mean, we can't get a massage Absolutely. now at the minute, but. Maybe I can find a oh, friend. Oh, you guys can't. <laughs> we, we, ours are open out here, so. Ah, oh, ah, oh, they're not at the minute. We're in a third lockdown in the UK. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're strapped down pretty good. Yeah. Okay, and uh -oh. then here's and then here's the monarch this uh, that's in your domestica class. So if you're interested in her class, yeah. right up the top of the screen, we talk slash Ferris will get you to the domestica page to sign up for a class it's 20 bucks so it's um uh, a nice price for that and then you learn how to stitch this monarch uh design yeah it's kind of it's similar to the same format as my online my digital tutorials and my kits that you can get in my shop but this is just kind of like a video version of it so it's all it depends on what way you learn basically um yeah it is I, I kind of, I'm actually there. You can actually physically see me stitching every single bit, basically. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Well, so a real, uh, a real uh, plus there in that people who want to see you do it can do that through this class and then emulate yeah. that. So that's good. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So you can do that. So 20 bucks uh, is, is the class. Now uh, the kit, are you selling the kit separate or people source that themselves or how does that work? The kit for the Monarch Butterfly? Yes. Yeah, there isn't a kit. It's, uh, when you go and you get the course, the video course, it all comes with these downloadable materials that I've designed and you can print it out at home and I tell you everything you need to get. You're not left alone at any time. Okay. I, I tell them where to order. And there's also a forum where... Which, which is really cool with the Domestica site, which I don't have my Etsy shop. There's a forum where you can all talk. And I've seen people from different countries going, where do you get the fat? What is cotton calico? <laughs> and it's kind of, everyone's discussing it. And I'm like, I don't know what the word is in your country for it. <laughs> but it's nice where you have the forums where you can discuss back and forth. And uh, people answer, answer the questions sometimes that I can't always answer, which is nice. Yeah. So that's uh, uh, right up at the top there on the screen. You can go and, and check out her course at Domestica. And if you go to her Instagram page, uh, there's uh, several posts about her trip to uh, Spain to record all of this. And that's, mm. that's a fun thing to watch. Uh, you had a good time mm -hmm. doing it. Well, we talked about that in the podcast, too. Yeah. Had a good time doing that. Yeah. So. Yeah, that was fun. I loved yep. it. <laughs> I'm going to put us back on screen now. Okay. So there we are. Yep. Emily, that was really fun. We got oh, here. Haley says, would you ever consider being a tutor at the Royal School of Needlework or writing a book about embroidery? Um, I would love to write a book. I might be possibly 
in the process of making one. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> and yeah, I really want to teach workshops. If before lockdown, that was my goal. I wanted to travel to America and Australia and Canada and and, and England and start actually uh, interacting with people in real life. And I think that'd be really fun. One yeah. day in the future, I'd love to do that. When we're allowed out of our houses, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. All right. I think we'll wrap this up. Yep. Emily, really, really enjoyed it. Thanks. Thanks for making the time. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. We learned so much. All right. Uh, so check that out if you're interested in her class. And thanks to Emily. And thanks to everybody for uh, joining us. And Wednesday night now, uh, the Stitch Hour, Natalie Dupuy on color. So get more of what we just talked about this afternoon. So that's good. Uh, all right. <laughs> Thanks to everybody for joining us. Bye. 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 <laughs>